so the first, I think we all know how this goes. Um, you get to choose if you, out of the three that I'm going to show you, if you would own it, rent it, or trash it. And we are going to go with the first one, Hitchcock movies, Psycho, The Birds, and Vertigo. Why would you do this to me, Tracy? <laughs> yeah. Why would, is, why would you do this to Why me? is this the first question? <laughs> I own all three of these. <laughs> I, own two, I own two of these, so one yeah. of these answers is going to be easy. Tyler, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, only because I haven't actually seen it. I'm going to trash the birds, although it's on my list. Um, fuck, I'm going to say Rent, Vertigo, and Own Psycho, just because this shower scene still gets to me. I'm not going to lie. Okay. I think I'm going to have to... Uh own the birds because it's my favorite of these three films. I do recommend it if you haven't watched it. Um, I hate, I hate myself. I'm probably <laughs> going to rent psycho and trash vertigo, but like I fucking hate myself because vertigo is so goddamn pretty. And yeah. it's, the, it's the kind of film you could just like put on like, if you get like a hundred inch like LED thing, put it on the side of a wall and just have it play. Like you could just have it play silently in a museum or, or in a gallery and like no one would question it. It looks so goddamn good. Um, and like there's so much going for it in terms of like the relationships between like Jimmy Stewart and uh, I forget the name of the actress. Was it Kim Novak? Um, I, think, I think so, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the back and forth between those two. Uh, the way the, the switch happens, like all of the psychological aspects of it. But I think I would rather just like sit down and have a beer and watch Psycho as opposed to like worship at the altar of Vertigo, you know? So I think yeah. that's why I would say rent Psycho, trash Vertigo. But I, I, own, I already own all three of them. So I think <laughs> I, I need love, to... Uh... I was just gonna say, I think I need to rewatch The Birds again. I saw it in college and my biggest, I, w I think my entire mood shifted when they killed off Suzanne Plachette's character because I thought she was like so such an interesting character and I would have had it <laughs> reversed where the blonde one got killed first, but that's just me. But I would, I, I think I need to give it another shot for sure. Yeah, for me, like if I were to ever make a movie, I think The Birds would be the movie that I steal from the most. There's just a lot of like cool little tricks and things that Hitchcock does in that film that I love to death. And so, yeah, it's the one that I keep going back to and rewatching for that reason. I love and feel bad for mindless me so much just based on what he said oh. in the chat. I have been attacked by birds in real life. So <laughs> hey man, a, a seagull has pooped on me. And if I can <laughs> put that behind me, then maybe you can put that behind you. In fact, actually a seagull has also hit me in the face with its wing. Like I have also been accosted by birds and I somehow get enjoyment out of this film. I have come close because Canadian geese are assholes. Very true. Very so true. these are the number one ranked uh, Pixar films on IMDb. I did not do um, sequels because I believe Toy Story 2 is actually above this, the first one. I don't know, something like that. I just chose non-sequels. Um, so now you'd have to own, rent, or trash these. I'm going to trash Finding Nemo. That's actually pretty easy <laughs> from that from that perspective. Um, and then between Toy Story and Inside Out, which one do I want to watch more often? Probably Toy Story. Probably I probably want to watch that more often. Inside Out is like, oh, I need to babysit my friend's kids, so we'll show them Inside Out or something <laughs> like that. Like It's not something I would need to have with me at all times. So yeah, I own Toy Story, Trash Finding Nemo, and Rent Inside Out. I hot take, I'm gonna trash Inside Out because I actually do, Tracy already knows this, I like the second one a lot more than the first one and it was kind of what I was expecting from the first one to begin with. And I rewatched Toy Story last year and I still really liked it, but it, I, I don't know what it is. It lost a little bit of magic. So I'm gonna say Rent, Toy Story and um, own Finding Nemo. I still remember vividly seeing Finding Nemo back when it first came out and that was quite an experience. 
Yeah, I mean, these are all so highly ranked, so it's no one's necessarily wrong. And for good, no and for good reason. You know? So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, I... I um, uh, that's a that's a uh, I, I i yeah i i don't know that's a tough one i feel like i would probably i might go with tj on this just for my personal like opinion but i have not watched rewatched finding nemo in a long time i think i only saw it in theaters so if i on a second watch i might and i loved it when i saw it but um yeah i think so i would probably own Toy Story. Uh, yeah, see, owning Toy Story Inside Out are, are tough for me, but Inside Out, I feel like, is a maybe a heavier movie. I mean, Toy Story definitely pulls on the heartstrings a lot, too, but yes, these are tough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these are the top three ranked uh, Tom Hanks movies. Ah. <laughs> All uh, of my children. Uh, all together. No kidding. Well, you get to go first this time, Tyler, so... Oh, uh... Don't remind me. <laughs> Um, again, mostly because I've never seen it all the way through. I'm going to trash Philadelphia, even though I've seen parts enough of it to know that it is good. But these two really is between deciding your own children. Ah, <laughs> uh, I'm going to regret saying this, but I'm going to say rent Private Ryan and own Forrest Gump just because... I think because Forrest Gump is a lighter movie and there's more reason to be sentimental towards it. And it's a movie that my mom and I have watched together on our own so many times and have cried together as we like ordered out. It was, hell, there was actually a Christmas Eve at my dad's side where it was actually on halfway through right during the Vietnam sequence. And for whatever reason, my grandparents, aunts and uncles, we all just stuck with it because we knew it was that good and saving private ryan is probably a better movie but because of how bleak it is it's not as rewatchable so i'm gonna say rent private ryan and own forrest gump okay this is this is gonna be weird uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna trash forrest gump i had that movie on vhs when i was a kid and i think i've seen it enough <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't, I don't need to keep it around. I'll give you that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the other two, actually, I haven't seen uh, that much of. Saving Private Ryan was in that weird place. I think it came out in like 2000 or 2001, uh, where like I wasn't really buying as much physical media anymore, and I, I didn't, I never really had it at home to watch it over again. So I think I've only seen it like once, and maybe that was on like TV, not even in theaters. And then Philadelphia was a more recent discovery because it, I think it's one of the movies that Jonathan Demme made after Silence of the Lambs. Yes. So, so between the two, if we're thinking about this like practically, I'm probably owning Saving Private Ryan because if I ever one day have the epic home theater system of my dreams, that's probably going to be a movie that I would put on to show off like how good the sound system is. <laughs> That uh, beach in and, Normandy would do the trick. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and then Philadelphia would be a rental just because I think um, because Jonathan Demme, he like often worked with the same cinematographer. It's kind of interesting to watch Sounds of the Lambs and then watch Philadelphia because they do a lot of the same um, things with like, you know, the actors looking straight into the camera and things like that. But obviously it's, it's coded differently when it's, you know, Hannibal Lecter versus... Uh, Tom Hanks uh, doing that, uh, depending on you know the role that they're in and what they're doing in the scene. Um, so I think I think Philadelphia like is is good to watch occasionally, but I think Saving Private Ryan would be the one that I'd pull out to impress people, or if that's I just valid. want to be depressed. You know? Oh, that's valid, and um, it's funny you mentioned the cinematographer Tak Tak Fujimoto has not only worked for Demi, but has done like Shyamalan, John Hughes, really. Wow. Yeah, he's, uh, he's even, done a lot, but I think, he, yeah. And even that thing you do with Tom Hanks, that's an interesting choice. <laughs> yeah, but I think he's done like five or six films with Demi. Like, I think there's like a, I think there's a string of films like all in a row, like Married to the Mob, uh, Philadelphia, obviously Signs of the Lambs. Like, there's like Something a run of like wild. five or six. Yeah, yeah. And they they were just working together for like years together. And you can actually like watch 
the evolution of the um, of the visual style of Demi's work because like uh, that cinematographer was just getting kind of like better and better and more comfortable and more comfortable. And I think it kind of like peaked at Silence of the Lambs, but then you can also see it in the films that came after as well. And I'm just realizing the sequences I have seen of Philadelphia, like when he's in the library or when he meets Denzel for the first time, they have those exact techniques that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it. I think Philadelphia has like it's. I was so blown away when I watched it, and I, I, I it's a hard movie though to be like I'm going to throw this on a lot. You know what I mean? It's the rewatchability yeah. factor. It is tough there. Yeah. Um, All three of these films are kind of bleak in their own way. Yes. Oh my God. True. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to the next slide. We have all of Jordan Peele's filmography as of late. Get Out, Us, and Nope. So I guess I get to go first now. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. This is once again going to be weird because I own Nope but it's going to be the one that I trash <laughs> because I've, wa I've watched it once after buying it. I'm probably going to watch it one more time. And then maybe once again, once, when I get that super sick sound system, uh, I'll, I'll throw, I'll throw it on a third time. But after that, like it's, it's getting sold. I don't think there's really a need for me to watch it or keep it around uh, forever and ever. Uh, and then I think then I would just own get out and rent us uh, basically just in order of how much I enjoy those two films. I think get out is uh, a wonderful movie. Uh, one that I probably would watch uh, a couple of times more. And then us would just be kind of like, yeah, that occasional movie. I really like Lupita Nyong'o. It'd be nice to have her come hang out. Uh, and yeah, yeah, this is, this, this wasn't as much of a, a kill your darlings type of selection, but still, still, still tough. Yes. No, th this is going to be easy for me. Um, I would own Get Out, Rent Us, and Trash Nope. I I didn't even like Nope when it came out, so it didn't really do anything for me. And Us, I went with a bunch of uh, co-workers to see, and we all had a good time. We had a Facebook group where we kind of theorized the hidden meanings and symbolism, and then when I bought it and rewatched it at home, because I had already deciphered all that stuff, it somehow lost some suspense. But it was it, it was worth a second watch, but I don't know if I would ever see it again. And Get Out was just such a huge surprise at how good a filmmaker Jordan Peele was. Like he, I don't want to say he's super stylish or anything, but he is meticulous enough in his approach. And when you hear him talk about other horror movies, he clearly is a fan and knows what he's talking about. But I'll be honest, I don't think he's really captured that spark that Get Out had since his other stuff. No, that's fair. And I um I think I need to rewatch Nope. I didn't I didn't dislike it. Um I think it's definitely like the quieter film and I think it is there's a lot more of it criticizing Hollywood um, and that's, you know, and it is also, there's so many homages to Spielberg in that one. Um, but I, I, I and Akira. Yeah. And yep. I, I don't necessarily gravitate towards like, I'm going to throw that one on um, like I would the others. Um, so I, I kind of agree with, with you guys on that. Um, we've got uh, another one. This is going to be David Fincher films. <laughs> and I think we just have one more after this. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> again, this is going to be a hot take, but uh, I find some of the characters in Social Network a little too unlikable. I know that's what they were like in real life and shit, but the story of Facebook just never grabbed me all that much. So I'm going to say trash Social Network. Sorry, but um, I love David Fincher detective movies the most. So I would say Rent, Zodiac, and Own Seven, because not only was Seven like the first true Fincher movie, it uh, it's one of his most suspenseful because of how bleak it is, the incredible performances. I mean, it's still like top five for Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, and for Kevin Spacey as bizarre as some of that sounds these days but uh even with everything even with how dark and grim it is it's somehow still rewatchable just because the mystery itself and the procedural and the team dynamic between Pitt and freeman is just that good 
Yeah, I'm not really going to be able to disagree with that. Um, I think, once again, going back to Forrest Gump, I think I've just seen The Social Network too many times recently. And I think I've become kind of like a social network reactionary where like so many people have told me it's like one of the best American films of all time. I'm like, no, it's not. I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to the other two, um, I think Seven is always going to have a very special place in my heart. Um, going back to what I was mentioning about the girl with the needle and how the aesthetic is very uh, detailed. Uh, it's, it's the same thing with Seven. It's, it's a grimy city. It's a disgusting city. So much of that film is built into the production design where no one really needs to tell you, aside from Gwyneth Paltrow when she says, I hate this city, <laughs> no one needs to tell you that it's a bad place to live. You just know it's a bad place to live. You know it's the you know from you know even if you've never experienced film noir before, you kind of understand that these this is bad things happening to people in a bad place, and uh, there's just so much you can dissect from it, so much you can get from it. Even if you're just learning about how to make films, the way that Fincher moves the camera around, the way that he captures um, moving from space to space or within spaces, like it's it's really, really solid stuff. And considering it's like one of his very first films, it's pretty remarkable. Um, I think also it just has that nostalgia thing for me. Like I think it's what a 1995, 96, 97 ish kind of film. Yeah. yeah I, I would have been about 12 or 13 when it came out. And so it would have been like that, that cool edgy film that the cool kids talk about because <laughs> their parents don't care if they watch rated R movies. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, like it's, it's, it's a film I've seen a lot, but it's a film that, uh, I have a lot of history with and a film that I would definitely revisit. Uh, I think there's a new 4K version of it coming out like end of this year or like early Ooh. next year or something. So I'll probably I'll probably be buying that because that's going to be my own. Uh, and then for Zodiac, yeah, I think that's still a very, very solid film. One that I would watch, you know, every couple of years on a rental basis. Um, yeah, it's 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 very, very good but uh, to me, not as good as Seven, not as personal to me as Seven is. And ironically, uh, my favorite Fincher movie is actually his Dragon Tattoo remake, considering I had yeah. already read the book, I had already seen the Swedish version, but this one still made me feel the most tense. And I remember when my parents saw it on their own, even though it fucked them up that much, it was still worth it. Like Fincher knows how to make the darkest shit seem entertaining and rewatchable. I don't know how sick of fuck you have to be in order to do that. It um, part of the reason the killer has gotten better when I rewatched it is that it is lighter and more mundane in comparison to his other stuff. Like it was a fresh enough change of pace while still having like the stuff that we expect from him. Hmm. I, I would say I agree with you guys on on everything you said for there. Uh, we do have the final one. So this is going to be Paul Thomas Anderson, <laughs> uh, Boogie Nights, Magnolia, and There Will Be Blood. So luckily, luckily I saw Boogie Nights like a month ago. Oh. Uh, other, otherwise, I would not have been able to participate in this. Uh, trash Magnolia, who gives a shit? <laughs> um, it's, no, it's, it's a really good movie, but I... Uh, I don't have any love for it in my heart. Um, I think I would probably take Boogie Nights over There Will Be Blood, own Boogie Nights and rent There Will Be Blood. I, If I hadn't seen Boogie Nights, I would have said There Will Be Blood own, but Boogie Nights was just so, I saw it on 70 millimeter, I saw it on film, so I was able to get that, get the warmth out of it, get the detail out of it, um, out of the uh, out of the image, I should say. And like Mark Wahlberg, like why the hell is he, <laughs> not that good in every movie, you know? <laughs> uh, I wish he could be like that in everything. Um, but yeah, like the, just, I'm bad at this. I've been talking for too long, but Boogie Nights, great, 100%. Uh, and There Will Be Blood, also very good. One of Daniel Day-Lewis's best performances. Uh, great score, dirty, disgusting oil movie. Yeah, once again, my words are escaping me, but uh, Rent, Rent, There Will Be Blood. Boogie Nights would own that. Yeah. I yeah. pretty much have the exact same thought, but I will say I've only seen bits and pieces of Magnolia, and while it wasn't bad or anything, it wasn't the most investing I had seen. There Will Be Blood 
we all remember it for Daniel Day Lewis and for certain scenes. Paul Dano, I don't think it's as memorable as some people make it out to be, though it is still really good. But I mean, Boogie Nights is just. It's one of the rare movies of his that just about any adult could enjoy. And I say any adult specifically because, <laughs> yeah, well, we all know why. It's a big dick. <laughs> but you didn't yeah. have to spell it out. But uh... <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, There Will Be Blood is, is, was, is such an epic film. And I don't know how much of a, it's, it's not an easy one to throw on as frequently as Boogie Nights for sure. Um, and Magnolia, I think the performances and those specific storylines um, are really what, I mean, it's almost like this this constant rhythm within Magnolia that it kind of pieces all these um, sequences of these people's lives together in, in a really brilliant way that I love. Um, but I would say definitely to own, if I had to watch it a bunch of times, it, out of all of them, it would have to be Boogie Nights for sure.